I'm Megan Lieberman in Tampa, kicking off four days of live coverage of the 2012 Republican Convention. They have just gaveled the convention to order, so let's listen to what's happening on the floor. Republican National Convention in session and called to order. The chair announces, pursuant to Clause 12, Paren B, Paren 1 of Rule 1 of the Rules of the House of Representatives, the 2012 Republican National Convention stands in recess subject to the call of the chair. All right. All right. Looks now like it's going to be a short recess. day on the floor here, and so I'm here with national political correspondent Jeff Zeleny to talk about how Isaac has upended plans. So, Jeff, we're having a, a minute of sort of activity on the floor, but basically today is a lost day for them. It is a lost day for them, and we've heard Chairman uh, Priebus gaveling the convention, and he's debuting right now the uh, U.S. national debt clock. It's sort of a gimmick that Republicans are doing to show how much the debt is rising during these four days of the convention. but. Right now, they're going to go out of session because of the storm of uh, tropical. Uh, Which didn't really make it here. But. Storm Isaac. <laughs> it didn't, but it really is an issue in a bigger sense for them because they were hoping to start the reintroduction of Mitt Romney right now. That has to begin now, tomorrow. Right. And these events are always so scripted, and they've gone to great pains to make this a very controlled event this time. But the weather just doesn't cooperate, and then you have to roll with it. The weather didn't cooperate, and they have planned everything out by the minute to give every detail of Mitt Romney's life, every element of Paul Ryan's life, and now they're going to have to abbreviate that a little bit. And there are actually some practical uh, problems with that, because they also wanted to give every single person every in the Republican Party exactly. a time to talk. Now, some people are not going to talk at all, and uh, the proceedings are going to begin now uh, tomorrow. And there's some politics to that, right? There are people who've got to be unhappy about being cut out, and right. some people have gotten right. shorter shrift here, haven't they? Right. The people we are going to see are the new shining lights of the Republican Party. Governor Nikki Haley of South Carolina will be right. on stage tomorrow night. Ann Romney, of course, will be on stage tomorrow night. And in Governor Chris time. Christie. <laughs> but all their speeches were short. Shunkated, yeah. We're not going to see Mike Huckabee. The former Arkansas governor, some of the older people in the party. The former we're governors not are not getting such a big play, right? Exactly. But we are still going to see the Ron Paul delegation here. They are going to be making um, a protest tomorrow on the floor. They think they've been mishandled a little bit. So that will be one also unscripted moment of this convention. Right. And the, the sort of vacuum of the, the, the lost day today has kind of created a little bit more of an opening for those things to pop up, hasn't it? It absolutely has. It's um, allowed some space in this schedule that was supposed to be like literally minute by minute planned out here. And, the, and some of these protests are real. The Ron Paul people are coming here with very full delegations from at least three states. And they believe that they weren't treated that well by the Romney campaign. But overall, this is still Mitt Romney's convention. And it's really giving him a potential to sh uh, sh show some leadership as well. So right. the storm is the one thing that will allow us to see in real time how his how team works, things, how right? he makes these decisions. I mean, his campaign is already saying that they're spending more time on the weather than in politics. If we see big storm damage in New Orleans, other places, this convention will stop once again. Right. And we know that this poses a, a challenge not just to Mitt Romney, but actually to some of these state conventions. It does. Right? So uh, we had a, a photojournalist, a video journalist, uh, Craig Duff, go look at the Mississippi delegation this morning. So let's take a look at what he found. Right. Mississippi's having our state delegation breakfast. I think there are delegation breakfasts going on all over the city. We want to go back to Mississippi ready to make sure that, that we come in with a very strong vote on behalf of the Romney Ryan ticket. Well, we're monitoring the hurricane. Anytime we hear the word hurricane uh, in the Gulf South, it always causes you to pay attention. I think the thought here, everyone is just kind of concerned, absolutely concerned, you know, about uh, really about what's going to happen to the rest of the country. Where's this storm going to hit? Is it going to go back to New Orleans or may have hit Mississippi? You get up in the morning and you turn the TV on and you're looking at the weather channel. <laughs> the track they had on uh, the weather this morning uh, was bringing this storm right up the same track as Katrina. And Katrina uh, 
flooded New Orleans, but it slammed the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Of course, we in the South, in the Gulf South, uh, we see hurricanes a lot. And uh, we're doing what we always do. We're praying for the best, but preparing for the worst. This is not our first rodeo. <laughs> uh, we've been through Category 5 uh, with Katrina. We're carrying on the business regardless of the hurricane. People in Mississippi are used to preparing for and dealing with hurricanes, and I'm sure that our governor is uh, doing that right now with everybody available back home. Many of our staffers from the governor's office, they already left yesterday. We're telling our delegation, first things first. Take care of your family, take care of your property, and if you need to go home, go home. Uh, we hope and pray that there's not a lot of damage anywhere, but for the convention Wednesday and Thursday night, it'll be appropriate to pay attention to what has happened with the hurricane, but it'll still be a great launch pad for Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan. So Jeff, this is a tough balancing act, and they want to go on with this. They want the stage show right. here. But if there's real devastation somewhere, they can't ignore that, can they? No question. All of these videos we're seeing here right now are about Mitt Romney, right. what he would do if elected president. But that is not going to be well as a split screen image if there is devastation, especially coming on the seventh year anniversary of Katrina. And Governor the Haley Barber, former governor of Mississippi, we talked to him this morning and we saw him there. I mean, he is uh, he's also advising this convention and the Romney campaign how to handle things here going yeah, forward. As a former head of the RNC, he has a pretty good sense of this part of the, the he process, absolutely too. Does. Yeah. But what the Romney campaign says, they are monitoring things overnight. They're going to do the official business on Tuesday to get the roll call vote sounded. After all, that's what needs to happen here. And then they'll play things by ear, hour by hour. Right. And there's also the uh, possibility that not just that this could be a distraction for them, but in fact that it could give the president a presidential moment. If he can sort of say, I've called in FEMA, I've called in the National Guard, if something big happens somewhere. No question at all. We saw that a little bit yesterday from the White House. They were very quick to point out that uh, President Obama was on the phone with uh, Florida Governor Rick Scott, which is normal. That would have happened anyway. But the White House knows it is walking a fine line here. They cannot be overly political in terms of going to visit New Orleans or Mississippi quickly should something happen. So I think both sides have to walk a fine line. But it gives the president a leadership moment to insert himself in a legitimate way into the this convention. Thanks so much, Jeff. Thank you. Outside the convention walls, we've had a lot going on this morning with protesters marching through downtown Tampa to the convention center. Colin Moynihan reports. This is Colin Moynihan reporting from uh, the streets outside the convention center where the Republicans will be holding their convention. Uh, about an hour ago, several hundred people left a park in downtown Tampa, and they have embarked on a slow-moving march through the streets, uh, brandishing signs, chanting, and playing musical instruments, and uh, a large contingent of police officers have been accompanying them and following them on bicycle and on foot and riding in police vehicles. As the crowd neared the convention center, Chief Castor, uh, the head of the Tampa Police Department, uh, stood on the sidewalk and watched the uh, ranks of uh, protesters file past. Chief Castor told reporters that everything was going well and the protesters were headed for an assembly zone that had been set up uh, to accommodate demonstrations outside of the convention. And yesterday, some of Mitt Romney's primary opponents, Ron Paul, Michelle Bachman, and Herman Cain, held events of their own. Damn a constitutional right. Ron Paul. On Sunday, there were a number of rallies around Tampa staged by various groups, all with one intention, to steal thunder from the official action just a few miles away. The largest was a gathering of Ron Paul supporters inside the Sun Dome at the University of South Florida. Thousands of supporters came there to cheer on the man they wished had been the Republican nominee. Monetary policy is, is important and the reason that ultimately we get rid of the Fed. The speakers came out swinging against the GOP, taking a harshly critical tone. One speaker called Ron Paul. He is a clean bump in a sea of garbage. 
overall, the Sunday rallies might be seen as something of a consolation prize for campaigns that were unable to make it to the finish line. Outside of the Paul rally, the Tea Party held a gathering at a Tampa church on Sunday evening to a boisterous crowd of several hundred. I'm at a Tea Party rally and Herman Cain's about to take the stage. Earlier, Representative Michelle Bachman of Minnesota spoke. They weren't given roles at the Republican National Convention, but that hasn't stopped them from getting their messages across. I'm here to say to the Tea Party tonight, when you've been watching the Republican Party platform this week, the Tea Party has been all over that platform. Because these concepts, tax enough already, don't spend more than what you take in, and follow the Constitution, are now a part of the Republican Party platform. One person who went hardly mentioned at all was the presumptive Republican nominee, Mitt Romney. Herman Cain quit the race in January amid accusations of sexual harassment. On Sunday, he blamed his withdrawal on, quote, lies and dirty politics. Even though I am no longer seeking the position of president, I am still on a mission to defeat Barack Obama. I'm joined now by Susan Salney, who was at the rallies yesterday. So, Susan, let's start with Ron Paul, because Ron Paul's the one who got the crowds. He did. 10,000 strong, Megan, packed the Sun Dome at the University of South Florida. Think about this hall right here. It's 20,000 capacity. So it was quite a lot of and people. These people are shipped in. <laughs> they, and they came from all over the country to see Ron Paul, and it was a high-energy, high-octane event. People were literally dancing in it the aisles. It was quite a rock star reception, it wasn't was, it? It was, absolutely. It was his thank you to them, but also their thank you to him. You could really feel it in the air. And he was definitely feeling it to the point that he, he said a couple things that were a little out there, didn't he? He really did. He took every opportunity to sort of punch back at the mainstream of the party. He wasn't given a speaking role at this convention, so this was his one opportunity to speak in an uncensored way to his followers. And he really was uh, classic Ron Paul. <laughs> so what do the Paul people at this point want from this convention? Was it just a, a rallying moment to say, like, this is our guy? Or are there actually concrete things they're hoping to get out of this couple of days They're hoping to take here. his ideas into the future. And I talked to several people who specifically who said they plan to do that on the internet and through social media and to, to keep his ideas alive however they can at, at rallies in the future and in uh, the next campaigns. So let's talk about the Unity event that Michelle Bachman right. and Herman Cain so had. Very different event. Other side of town. It was held in the church. And right from the beginning, that sets a different tone, right? So it was a much quieter, smaller event, it, as opposed to several thousand. There were several hundred people there. Michelle Bachman spoke. Herman Cain spoke. And it was sort of like a flashback to the primaries. To be at this event, you might think that it we were still in January. In January. <laughs> right. <laughs> that indeed, the. Their campaigns are over, but you wouldn't have known it yesterday. And were they sticking to kind of the lines that they had kept up during the campaign? Absolutely. It was striking that there was very little mention of Mitt Romney or um, Paul Ryan, but a lot and of Herman promotion. And Herman Cain was still on 999. He and was. A, a lot of promotion of their own brands. Right. And, and Herman Cain really did have the crowd going a little bit He himself, did. Um, didn't he? he was the last speaker, the keynote. They waited a long time for him, and he delivered. He was classic Cain. <laughs> <laughs> had a lot of zingy punchlines and really got them moving. They, they roared at the end. They were very happy to see him. Thanks, Susan. Throughout the conventions, we'll be featuring periodic looks at voters across the spectrum. Up first, a young Republican from Arizona. Let's take a look. I think my earliest memory of political activity was uh, actually in 2000 when Bush was running and I knew that my parents were voting for Bush and at school we had a straw poll and I was only in second grade but I remember it, it coming over the announcements that Bush had won our straw poll. I was like okay cool, our guy won. In my junior year of high school I heard that somebody was trying to start a teenage Republicans club so I went and met them and we decided to just establish a club with a teacher that agreed to sponsor us. I think that that first year of our club was a major uh, influence on me politically because I got to do a lot of cool things. I got to meet a lot of really influential people. And that really just kind of solidified my interest in politics. I, mess it up every time. I definitely felt a sense of, I guess, belonging to a sort of movement that really represented what I felt. So it's easy to become passionate about it. 
I am pro-choice. I disagree with the Republican Party in terms of abortion and gay marriage. I've, I've always been in favor of gay marriage. I never saw any reason to be against it. In my opinion, it's not hurting anybody. And who am I to stand in the way of somebody's happiness? And I see that with a lot of the students that I'm around, a lot of the college Republicans I know share a lot of the, the same liberal to moderate social views. And I think that that's actually changing the face of the party. I think that supporting Mitt Romney is a pretty easy choice for me, just because I found him to be the most qualified candidate solely based on executive experience and his economic background. I would actually prefer that Mitt Romney leave social issues sort of alone, because I do disagree with him on those things. While he keeps saying the first thing he'll tackle is either health care or the economy, and personally I'd prefer that he tackle the economy, because I'm graduating in a couple years, I'm actually looking for a job now, and it's pretty dismal where I am. Zeke Miller is a reporter at BuzzFeed, our convention partner, and he's been following the social media reaction to what's going on here in Tampa. So, Zeke, obviously the weather is yes. a big issue on social media, but what else is a big issue on social media today? Well, uh, obviously the rallies and the protests happened. The rallies we had yesterday with Ron Paul, Michelle Bachman, Herman Cain, and today the protests happening outside. There's a big Occupy contingent, as you saw earlier on the program. Um, and that's spilling out into the delegates. You know, some of them had to walk past that security here. It's very, very tight. There was very tight. As any of us who've been here and had to pass through it can tell you, it's blocks and blocks long. Yeah. So that's actually one thing everybody's talking about, you know, from, you know, anchors like Andrea Mitchell or, you know, <laughs> or just rank and file reporters. People call, have called this the tightest, uh, most secure convention in history. You know, there really is only one way to walk into this place. So it is a little tough, challenging, but that also meant that everybody had to see the protesters. So you're talking to delegates coming in here into the convention center, you know, reporters. Everybody's seen this, you know, it's sort of one big pool that everybody has to walk through on their way in. So you get the protesters, you get the, you, so you, you'll get Occupy, you'll get Ron Paul, you'll get, right. you know, And with nothing else protest. going on, there really is nothing else to, to talk about, right? Except Absolutely. the protests we just, and the rallies. We just saw about, you know, a minute, 30 seconds by my count of, uh, <laughs> uh, of conventions, of con and that's right. it. <laughs> And we're not going to have anything until tomorrow. Well, they're staying sort of tomorrow afternoon, but although I guess they could potentially move that up. Exactly. You know, there is also a little bit of uncertainty about what happens tomorrow with the weather again. And is that an issue on social media? The whole question of like, of A, the rescheduling, and B, what is this going to mean? Are they going to switch things up again? Is that, a, is that a big theme we're seeing? Yeah. I mean, you know, there was a rumor yesterday that perhaps we can talk Friday. about Friday. Yeah. Um, so, so far that hasn't, you know, we're not there yet, but the, can't, but the convention still isn't ruling that out. They're saying maybe we're looking, you know, it's look in C mode where the storm goes, just how strong it is when it hits the Gulf Coast. Uh, you know, and Governor Bobby Jindal you know, did cancel his visit here. And that really did take off on Twitter and, and, and Facebook to an extent. And you know, people are concerned about the Gulf Coast, especially given the anniversary with Katrina, but also just because you know, they, they canceled today and it's sunny out today, and tomorrow it's not going to be sunny in, you know, on the Gulf Coast. Yeah, and it, it's, it's hard to sort of know where this is going to go over the next couple of days, depending on how the schedule ends up switching up. Exactly. I mean, if they had to cancel Tuesday, or they, would they squeeze everything into a couple of days? Hopefully that doesn't happen. The storm does dissipate. I think that's, you know, what everybody is hoping for, given, you know, what New Orleans has seen over the past few years. But, you know, anything can happen, and I'm sure they're, you know, they've, they're telling us they've planned out every contingency. Um, it's I, a nightmare for everyone if they have to reschedule everything and stay here Friday, right? I mean, because we're all going to Charlotte, I mean. Right, I know. <laughs> Flights have been booked. Well, you'd have to reschedule 20,000 delegates, you know, who are here, uh, delegates, alternates, guests who are here that need to go home and, you know, hotels, you know, might not have room for them anymore. So that is a, a, a big thing on the mind of the delegates and the people who are here on social media, just what exactly goes on. I mean, beyond that, I mean, the other big story of the day. Um, it, you know, is the actual convention proceeding itself. A lot of the Ron Paul stuff yesterday did take off. Some of these rules changes might give us a bit of excitement tomorrow on the floor. Something to look forward to. Thanks, Zeke. We'll also have an we also have an open question on Facebook that we'll be getting to back later this evening. We're wondering, with the convergence of the Republican National Convention, Tropical Storm Isaac, the U.S. Open, and the crisis in Syria, where is your attention most focused today? We'll have the results tonight when we're back here at 7. That's all for me, but op-ed columnist Charles Blow takes over now, and he's joined by editorial board writer David Firestone. Take it away, Charles. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. This is Charles Blow. This is the fantastic New York Times newsroom here at the RZ, here with David Firestone. So, David, the lead editorial in today's paper is a fascinating one called 
Paul Ryan's social extremism. Summarize what that what's in that piece for our viewers today. Well, we have a candidate on uh, on a major ticket that's one of the most conservative in many, many, many years, uh, and both on a fiscal and a social basis. This uh, this editorial talks about uh, not only his uh, abortion uh, positions, which have become fairly well known, but uh, he has also opposed family planning grants. Um, he's opposed uh, coverage for birth control. Uh, he has opposed uh, all kinds of same-sex marriage acts and even hate crimes uh, that involved um, uh, homosexuality. Uh, you know, and, it's, and it's that remarkable. Works for, that works for Romney as a pick because what? Because that that appeals to the base. That's right. That, that he he himself, Romney wasn't seen as nearly social conservative enough for that base. Mm -hmm. And in, in fact, based on his past, he really wasn't. But Ryan uh, absolutely fits that bill, probably more than almost anyone he could have chosen. And as a result, it's a signal to uh, members of his base that this ticket is going to uh, stand for things that so, he wouldn't have done. So it's to fire them up, though, right? Because there's no way they were going to vote for Obama. So this was to make sure they show, they came out to the polls, they didn't stay right. home. But, okay, if you even if you get all of those voters, what does this do and what does this say about an appeal to the middle, which is what everybody basically says. You need the middle in order to win a presidential election. Right. How does the, Rum, the Ryan pick play to the middle? I'm not sure it does. In fact, I think that could have been a mistake that uh, that they made uh, in uh, in their overall calculations. I mean, mainstream uh, of American thought is not uh, abortion, you know, no abortion and no exceptions. Um, it is not an end to family planning and contraceptives. Um, and uh, I think it's going to make it harder for them to appeal to, say, suburban voters uh, who might tend to vote uh, Republican for fiscal reasons, for financial reasons, but uh, who might really be turned off by what they're and, hearing. And, and even so so we see them kind of pushing ahead into more of these social hot mutton issues that, you know, we had a story that I think the lead in the paper today was about some advisors secretly saying that maybe they need to, to be a little bit more, uh, a little harder on Obama in order to right. make this work. And in fact, to pick up more working class white voters. You think that this Ryan pick does that? Absolutely. Uh, I think it does appeal to them. And I think you're seeing the same kinds of thinking in the ads that they're running now on, uh, on welfare, which are blatantly false, uh, but uh, nonetheless seem to be picking up uh, some voters out there that they might not have gotten otherwise. Let's pivot a little bit from social conservatism to fiscal conservatism. And right. let's, let's look at that through the prism of the fact we have the storm coming, it, you know, it has the Gulf Coast in its sights, it's very likely to make landfall as a hurricane, um, and yet you have a Republican Party that has basically said that they would like to cut a lot of the, the agencies, budgets for the agencies that would do the response work for that storm. So you have this, this possibility, this real split screen right. between the federal government, which they say makes smaller and we re want to reduce their budget, working to help uh, save or to help people who have been impacted by the storm, and a Republican convention going on with people speaking and the same people who want to cut it. How is that going to play? That's actually happened already. I mean, because of Ryan's budgets and uh, other Republican cuts, they've already cut uh, emergency preparedness grants by about 43 percent over the last two years. That's the kind of stuff that really helped in the Joplin and Tuscaloosa tornadoes, for example, that will help in this tornado, uh, this uh, hurricane, that is. But it won't be there in future years because that money has been has been cut. And they're talking about other cuts in the future. So we have to wrap up here. So what does this, what is that split screen? going to mean? Who is that pitching to? Obviously, you know, the Gulf Coast states are not going to go blue anytime soon. Who are they? What do, who does that split screen uh, pitch to and who does it help and hurt? Well, I think it's, this is a reminder to voters on the fence that government continues to play a huge role and that government cuts can make a significant uh, impact on people's lives, which you don't hear from the uh, Republican platform uh, and the podium very often in a week like this. That's it. So that's it for today. Uh, we'll see you back here at 7 o'clock tonight, and we're up.